Hi, how are you doing? And I'm glad to see some folks come in. We're just taking care of a little bit of technological things, uh, trying to get our Facebook Live going with a little bit of uh, technological issues right off the start, just for this being the first real effort. Uh, just let's see here. I see there's some uh, different folks coming on, and I see some names I recognize popping in. If you have any questions, by all means, go ahead and pop in with them. Just to introduce myself, my name is Dave Kennedy. I am the curator at the Marshalls Museum here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. The mission of the Marshalls Museum is to be able to tell the 230-year story of the United States Marshals Service, the oldest federal law enforcement agency the United States has. It was created in 1789. Uh, it was signed into law by George Washington. It was the very first act taken by the United States Senate. So in today's modern terminology, it would have been Senate Bill Number 1 of the first United States Congress. And so it ended up creating the Office of the United States Marshal, and it helped kind of set the standard for everything that would follow for the Marshal Service. Uh, with the Marshal Service itself, their initial mission, it was very much similar to today's mission that they were supposed to help run the federal judiciary. And they were there to move uh, prisoners between districts. They were there to follow any lawful orders from the federal government. And in many ways, that is what they still continue to do today. Whether you're talking about uh, witness security, if you're talking about JPATS, more commonly known as Con Air, if you're talking about the guys in the blazers at every federal courthouse you might ever visit. Uh, they are also known today as just the same way that a lot of people think of them in the Old West as being the foremost uh, fugitive hunters in the country. Uh, every year the Marshal Service arrests uh, more federal and local fugitives than all of the other agencies put together. Uh, I mean, sorry, not all the other agencies put together, than any of the other individual agencies. Uh, just they are just that busy doing their jobs and they take care of a lot of the jobs. Uh, they are kind of thought of also as the uh, agency that does all of the other jobs. Uh, FBI has a very specific focus. ATF has a specific focus. Border Patrol, ICE, all those different agencies have their own specific focus. Marshal Service tends to take care of all of the gaps in between. And then after somebody from one of those other federal agencies arrests somebody, they typically get turned over in the Marshal Service hands as they go through the federal judiciary process and then any other actions that court service ends up producing as part of that. So as we've got some more people have come in, great to see a lot of folks coming in here. I see somebody's in here from Fayetteville. I know I've seen a couple people from, uh, I saw somebody from Illinois. I saw somebody from Arkansas, some here at Fort Smith. And so as we go through and see all the stuff in here, I'm going to uh, go ahead and start talking about the meat of what we're doing here. Uh, as with a lot of us, we are trying to do some social distancing. The staff of the Marshals Service, I'm sorry, the staff of the Marshals Museum uh, is social distancing, even though Arkansas is not a shelter at home state. Uh, we are doing what we can to help prevent the spread of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. And in doing so, all of our staff is off-site with the exception of myself being the collections person as the curator. It's kind of hard to work with a lot of that stuff over a computer, where if you're doing development or administrative work, if you are going to a whole bunch of Zoom meetings, which I know a lot of us are, uh, we are able to do that from our own home. But in the case of the job that the curator has in most museums, a lot of it has to do with being one-on-one -on -one with the objects in the collection. And so I'll talk a little bit more about my job as the curator. I will talk a little bit more about curators in general, and I'll talk about my job here with this particular collection. And so if we have to, uh, and as I see other questions have popped in through here. Uh, when we see any uh, when I see any questions that come along through here, I'll try to answer them. If it's an answer I do not have or is a responsibility of somebody else here at the Marshalls Museum, I will try and direct that person to where they need to go. Um, 
along the lines of people's perception of the marshals. Uh, there is a question in here about hack, how accurate was the Marshalls movie? I'm guessing you're talking about the film U.S. Marshalls with Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones's role in uh, both U.S. Marshalls and in the uh, film with Harrison Ford. Uh, oh, now I can't remember the name of the film. Uh, but both of those films were very close to what the Marshalls actually do. They show up, They especially if they're out after a fugitive, they don't care what the person did. All they know is that they have a piece of paper in their hand that says that person needs to go to participate in a court action of some sort. And so that's their job, is they want to go make sure that that body gets to the right place. And it, as, Tommy Lee Jones, as Tommy Lee Jones said, uh, that he doesn't care. It, when, when Harrison Ford's trying to say he's innocent, he was framed. Tommy Lee Jones didn't care because that's not his job. The marshals are not there to adjudicate anything. The marshals are there to do their job. And Al Butler, one of the foremost deputies of the 20th century, uh, he was at New Orleans when they integrated the school district. He was at Old Miss on the steps of the Lyceum. Uh, behind me, I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, we have a tear gas gun as well as uh, the helmet Al Butler wore at Old Miss. Uh, when they uh, brought that school together, uh, but then also through the 1960s and later, uh, Al Butler was very important in the Marshal Service. And one of my favorite quotes from him is, you put on the badge, you do the job. Essentially that you may not agree with what you're doing, but you still go out and do it. Uh, as for my job, and I said the question, oh, yeah, The Fugitive, that's the name of the film. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. Uh, other questions, I'll talk a little bit about Bass Reeves here in a bit. Uh, he is a very important part of the story that we tell here in Fort Smith and part of a good, uh, good important chunk of Marshall Service history from the late 1800s. But uh, my job as a curator is typical of curators across the country at a lot of different museums. I am responsible in many ways as the caretaker of the collection, all of our physical objects, and increasingly in our world, digital objects. Uh, the film footage, the audio files, uh, photographs, things like that, that we get in digital format. Uh, we are responsible for those if they're relevant to our collection. So our collection here is very much about how can we best tell the story of the Marshall Service. The other parts of our responsibilities tend to go towards being uh, I don't want to say the person, the, the know-it-all in the room, but we tend to also be the subject matter experts on our particular missions. Uh, so uh, myself and I rely greatly on Leslie, our director of education. Uh, she and I tend to be the two people who people bounce ideas and ask questions of here. Uh, my job here at the museum also is because I try to be a repository of the uh, the stories, the social history of the organization. Uh, I try to get hold of oral histories and other information about specific uh, deputies as we look through the organization's history. And as part of that, if somebody has, as part of their ancestry, somebody who they believe was a deputy or U.S. Marshal at some point in time, they can call the museum, contact me, uh, you can just get to us through our Facebook page or through our web page and you can contact me and say, hi, I've got this person who is my ancestor and the story in the family is that they were a deputy. Can you tell me about this? And we will try to find out more information about that. Uh, and we're always on the look for uh, materials related to people uh, so we can help better tell that story of those deputies. Uh, I see somebody's here from Cersei. Uh, <laughs> I think Denzel, and somebody's suggesting Denzel could play uh, Bass Reeves in a movie. Uh, I think Denzel, frankly, is starting to get on the north end of being able to play Bass Reeves. Uh, Bass Reeves, when he was really active in this area, was in his uh, 40s. Uh, and I know uh, Denzel's getting a little bit older for that. That'd be Bass, Bass Reeves in his later days. Um, but... With my job here, and part of it's doing things like this, talking to the public about our collections, about our story, and about our history. Uh, I get to work with a lot of 
first person, well, the first hand original source material documents from archives around the country. I get to deal obviously with the materials that we have in our collection and I get to deal with other information sources, whether I get to work with the historian from the Marshall Service or I get to work with other historians and other museum curators around the country. The training for a curator in general, uh, in a lot of museums, you're going to have somebody with a master's degree or higher in that particular field. Uh, if you were looking at art curation, in a lot of places, Crystal Bridges, fine museum up the road from here, most of the curators will have a doctorate degree in art history or a similar, uh, similar uh, function at school. But a lot of people, you, you don't have to have the masters to be a curator, it's just a lot of museums, they tend to have that. And especially with the larger museums, you will very much start to go towards higher ends of uh, having one master, two masters, maybe a doctorate, uh, just depending on the subject, depending on the expectations of the organization. But a lot of that ends up coming down to uh, what the job entails. And for that job, at a lot of places, the stories end up coming in with the in a lot of different museums. If it's a smaller museum, you'll have probably the one curator who's responsible for all of that, being the subject matter expert and the collections and maybe the public outreach regarding that story. As, as museums get larger and larger in size, a lot of those jobs might get farmed out. Uh, at some museums, you'll have a curator who's responsible as a subject matter expert and oversees the collection while you'll have a collection manager or maybe a registrar who is responsible for the day-to-day, -day, the records keeping, and making sure that the collections are taken care of safely. Uh, right now with our job, a lot of what we do is, uh, right now there's a lot of light in this collection space. We typically keep the lights down to a reasonable level just to help make sure that any textiles and any paper materials are not degraded by the light. Uh, anytime we handle any materials, uh, we're usually wearing gloves. Uh, we'll have either the cotton gloves like these. Uh, we might wear knife gloves depending on what we have that we're, going, that we're doing that particular day for the job. And then also the number one thing that impacts collections at any museum is uh, the environment. Uh, the relative humidity and the temperature in any collection space. Here at the Marshalls Museum, we have a brand new facility. Uh, we just recently have completed the building and you can see the there's a fly through that we have on our YouTube channel. And I think the fly throughs, we're gonna go ahead and link that here in a second. Uh, so you can go and check that later. Uh, for the fly through, I mean, for the building though, we have brand new HVAC system, heating and air conditioning, so we can maintain a really good quality of environment here in the building. And the collections area here, we have as a separate HVAC system all to its own just for this room that I'm in. And as part of that, I keep track, this right here is a data logger that keeps track of the temperature and the humidity. Every five minutes, it files it away on a little chip. And then I can go back and take a look at those files later on to see how well the system has been doing. And so we try to keep our temperature and humidity relatively flat. Uh, we try to keep it around 68, 69, 70 degrees for temperature. And we try to keep it between 45 and 55% humidity. Uh, that helps kind of keep track, keep everything in general on a good solid line. Uh, it's not too dry for the paper materials. It's not too wet for the metal materials. And it, with between the combination of the temperature and the humidity, we can better take care of what we have here in our collection, uh, not just for now or a year from now or five years from now, but for 50 and 100 and 200 years from now. So not only will we be able to see it and our kids can see it, but this way our grandkids and their grandkids can continue to see this and help share this story uh, because we feel that these materials are so important. And so this is one of those things that we feel really strongly about here at the museum is just taking care of the materials. Um, so uh, a couple of the things that I would like to talk about, and by all means, if you have a question that you want to ask me here as the curator here, as a curator in general, or if there are particular stories from the collection that you want to hear about, uh, by all means, feel free to go ahead and type those into the comments, and I will be more than happy to answer those questions. Uh, I do have a little bit of show and tell. Uh, let me get the gloves back on here. 
have a little bit of show and tell because uh, one of the things, and it's um, almost some people have mischaracterized the, uh, and actually, I'll go ahead and I'll answer uh, Corby Dickerson's question here. Do we have a layout planned for the exhibits? I'm very curious to see what's planned. Uh, we do have plans for the exhibits. Everything is already designed. It's ready to go. And that's part of our development efforts right now. Uh, we've been uh, very forthcoming with our total goal. We, our, our development team is looking at $14.1 million. Uh, the first $8 million of that, which is our first initial goal, that will allow us to call up our production company to say, hey, go ahead and start building everything. And that's going to be producing everything from obviously the cases that you think of in a museum, but that's also going to be helping to produce all the computer software behind our interactives. Uh, and we're talking a level of interactives well beyond like you push this button, the light comes on, you push that button, a different light comes on. Uh, we have active, uh, we have very active uh, operations that are going to be planned for this that include everything from a uh, decision courtroom where you get to make decisions regarding whether or not if you're a deputy marshal and you're placed in a situation and you have to make a choice as to are you going to do A, B, or C, you'll get to pick out which one of those you want to do. And then not only will you compare those answers to everybody else in the room, but you'll get to find out what that historic deputy or U.S. marshal did in that decision and why they made that. And quite often we'll be surprised as to what people want to do or why they want to do things a certain way. Uh, also, regarding modern marshals training, we're going to be able to have you run through an exercise that shows you how thinking is affected by how exerted you are and, or by activity. And we'll have you recognize that's how, it's just the same way that the deputies learn at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia. They learn how to control their thinking, they control their heart rate in order to become better at their job. And so they are safer and they're better in control of what they're doing. So they don't have an accident uh, resulting in uh, anything from escape of a fugitive to loss of life on the other end, and both of which are bad outcomes. Uh, we're also going to have an amazing uh, storytelling opportunity in the uh, our section uh, Frontier Marshals. Uh, there, we're obviously, if you're going to be telling a story in the Old West, you're going to be in the saloon. So we'll have a saloon section that is going to have a variety of different activities from a bartender who is going to be able to tell stories and you'll see the stories happening in the mirror behind them as the mirror disappears and you'll see the screen or even uh, card games, electronic card games that will show you uh, different stories about the, uh, the good guys, the bad guys and the in-between because a lot of the deputies over the history of the organization, especially during the 1800s, they may not have been really great people. Uh, I think a lot of people who've been in, interested at all in the story of the Earp family uh, would recognize that they weren't always the best people. And honestly, one of the, fir the first time that Wyatt Earp ever came into uh, having any sort of interaction with the Marshal Service was here in the area around Fort Smith. And so excuse me while I'm doing this, my computer that's in front of me just kind of timed out. Uh, the first time he was involved with the Marshals here in the area around Fort Smith was he was arrested as a horse thief and was brought here to the Western District of Arkansas, put into jail in Van Buren, Arkansas, and then escaped prior to his hearing at the uh, court that, that was here at the time. This predated uh, Judge Parker uh, arriving here in town and predated the court showing up here in town. And let's see if I can get this back up quickly. But um, this is just going to one second. There we go. All right. So, uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of plans going right now for what we want to do with the exhibits. Uh, and if Casey hasn't already, she can drop the link for a fly through of the, of the exhibits. Uh, we also have more information on our webpage that talks about the exhibits in detail and what we want to talk about. Uh, but it's really just some amazing storytelling that's going on 
uh, Thinkwell Group in California. They've done an amazing job working with the Marshalls Museum in order to make sure, oh, oh there we go. And that's one of the fun things in this new building is to make sure that the lights go off is if we're not moving around a whole lot, there's a timer. So I mean, it's, it's again, part of the one side of trying to save money on all of our electrical costs. Part of it is also trying to make sure that if nobody's here in the space, the objects are protected by having the lights go dark. And so we don't leave the lights on overnight, possibly damaging objects. Um, so let's see here. Um, we have a little bit of everything. And then, uh, oh, Judy Clough, uh, if we have an exhibit of the voice arrest, uh, your husband's gun will be, yes, we do have uh, your gun, that gun, and we have another gun that were related to Christopher Boyce. If anybody's familiar with the story of the Falcon and the Snowman, uh, and actually, while I am thinking about it, uh, the Falcon and the Snowman, uh, that's kind of the first part of this. Uh, the character of, well, Christopher Boyce, he was known by, under the code name Falcon as part of that story. And as part of it, he ended up uh, going to prison and escaping from prison and then was on the run and they caught him in Washington. You can check, uh, there's all kinds of different information about his arrest. But while I'm here, there it is. We are in the middle of our inventory and these are two revolvers that were being carried by deputies when they arrested Christopher Boyce uh, as he was on the run in Washington State. So these are uh, Ruger Security 6s. At the time, that was a standard sidearm for Deputy U.S. Marshals. And we just happened to come across those again yesterday because those were the, uh, those were just, we're right now we're in the middle of doing a full inventory. Every year for the Marshal Service, we do an inventory of the collection because of our collection, a uh, full third of it is uh, on loan to us from the Marshal Service. Uh, that's everything from a lot of the firearms that you might have seen just behind me. That is a lot of the other stuff that's back in here. Uh, the Marshal Service is very happy to have us as part of this activity. We are not part of the Marshal Service. I am not a Marshal Service employee. Uh, we receive no funding from the Marshal Service, but we very much try to Hold on a second. There we go. Uh, the Marshal Service uh, is very happy to have us on board with them, and we are very privileged to be able to help tell that story. So we are uh, excited to be able to tell it. It really is a neat story. Um, I've been interested in it ever since I was a little kid and uh, watching John Wayne as Rooster Cogburn on my dad's lap. Um, Although we do anymore, we have to recognize that the story of Rooster Cogburn is a fiction, despite having, uh, we've had a number of folks show up over the years claiming that they were the descendants of Rooster Cogburn, which led to interesting conversations. Um, but uh, True Grit is very much a part of what a lot of people see with the history and the heritage, especially of Fort Smith. Uh, whether or not True Grit was factual, it was based in a lot of factual information and activity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've just recently lost the author. I don't know oh, that's why that. Casey, can you plug the uh, power adapter back in, please? The uh, author of True Grit, Charles Portis, unfortunately just passed away, I believe it was a month ago. Uh, but one of the things we have in our collection here, this is a first edition copy of Charles Portis's True Grit. And you'll have to excuse the occasional sound, like if you just pick that up on your speakers. Uh, we have uh, part of our care for this area, uh, both to humidify as well as to dehumidify the space. Uh, it is uh, one of those things that we, that was just a humidifier drain. But uh, to True Grit and Charles Portis, he researched his uh, story very, very well. And he came across a number of incidences uh, in the history of the Marshal Service in this region that he tells a story pretty accurately to what a lot of the Marshals would have been dealing with. Uh, from a critical perspective, 
the John Wayne film of True Grit was a John Wayne movie as that character. Uh, the as a historian, the more recent version of True Grit came out a few years ago. Uh, the uh, Coen Brothers version of it. Uh, it was much more accurate to the book, and I think if you watch that film in the book, you'll get a much better idea of what Fort Smith was like in the uh, 1870s, and I think you get a better idea of what life was like for Deputy U.S. Marshals during that time frame as well. But uh, that's one of our one of the things that's in our collection that we are very happy with, and uh, just as again to give you an idea of the kind of care that we take for anything. Uh, special boxes for some of our materials, special padding depending on what we have and what we need for it. Um, and then, so as we try to go on, we're trying to help expand that understanding of the uh, history of the Marshal Service from just being that 20 year period in Fort Smith and Indian Territory to being the entire 230 year plus history of the Marshal Service. Uh, everything from the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794 in Pennsylvania uh, all the way up to today. Uh, there are deputy U.S. marshals on the front lines uh, dealing with coronavirus, uh, whether in federal courthouses, uh, moving federal prisoners, um, some of the people who are being repatriated back to the United States with coronavirus are being put into quarantine. Those quarantines are typically being managed under part of the uh, previously established plan as being maintained by the Marshal Service. And so today they're even coming up. Uh, one of the other things that I was wanting to talk about, uh, obviously a lot of people ask questions about badges uh, with the Marshal Service. Which badge did the Marshals use? And today there are two particular badges that they use. And these badges are the uh, gold badge and the silver badge. They started using these back in the 1980s. Uh, this is the badge of a United States Marshal. This is the badge of a Deputy United States Marshal. And the difference between those two positions uh, are that every district, and this goes back to 1789, has a U.S. Marshal. And right now there's currently 90, 94 uh, judicial districts across the United States. Arkansas has an Eastern District and a Western District. Uh, you have Tennessee has Eastern, Middle, and Western. Uh, Oklahoma has Eastern, Western, and Northern District. Uh, different states, uh, a lot of states, uh, especially in the Intermountain West, have only one district. And so each district has one marshal. The number of deputies below that, uh, deputies are all professional Federal law enforcement officers, they all go through training, uh, whereas the U.S. Marshals are appointed by the President, approved by the Senate, and then the only requirements they have to have beyond that, besides passing some different background checks, is they have to have some sort of law enforcement background in their past. And so most of the people you're going to find today, some are prior service deputies, some have been city, county, state, or other federal law enforcement. Uh, I believe there's an ATF officer, a former ATF agent who is the U.S. Marshal for, I think it's Rhode Island now, uh, who also happens to be the first uh, Asian American uh, U.S. Marshal, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's a lot of stories like this, but uh, the deputy's badge within each district where there's only one Marshal, there are a number of deputies, and you will have a dozen or so in some districts, depending on how small they are, or what the budget is, or what the needs are. But then there are districts in the United States where there's more than 100 deputies in that district, simply to help take care of the amount of business, and the, essentially the volume that they have, whether it's taking care of court activities, working on uh, warrant and warrants for fugitives, or uh, prisoner transfers, or just any of the other jobs that come up as part of their duties. Second. Let's get that back up again. That's one of the worst things in the world about doing this the first time is just some of the technological stuff that you end up having to shake kinks out of. Uh, 
with the, and as soon as this gets back up, I'll be able to start going more directly to some of the questions that we have. But, excuse me? Oh, and it shut off over there too? Okay. <laughs> Hold on one second. There you go. Everything else is lowercase except for the first one. And as we are trying to go through here, we are having all kinds of fun trying to keep up with this. Um, but a couple of stories that I have right now, and I'll be getting back to your questions here in a bit. Uh, we have a couple of, one special badge that we have, uh, back to kind of one of the things that we have right now in our exhibits that is built up is we have a, uh, our hall of honor. It memorializes the uh, 376 men and women who died in the line of duty, uh, to the United States Marshal Service. Uh, I say men and women, there is one woman who's on there uh, currently. She uh, was killed tragically in 2011 as a task force officer. She was a Miami-Dade police officer. We just mentioned her on our social media uh, at the end of March as part of Women's History Month. Uh, so we wanted to mention her. Uh, we are looking at uh, telling these stories uh, of these 376 men and women uh, as we go through uh, our jobs. The first line of duty death was 1794. Uh, that was a U.S. Marshal in Georgia, all the way to the most recent one being a year ago, March, in uh, Rockford, Illinois. Uh, this badge that I have here is badge of Deputy U.S. Marshal Cheshire, and I have the credentials container for U.S. Marshal Kenneth Muir. Uh, they were both killed in 1983 in Medina, North Dakota. Uh, that's an incident that we get to talk about a little bit here at the museum. Uh, there was a question earlier about our exhibits. Uh, some people are concerned that uh, we are going to be very much everything very specifically to tell the story, uh, like just a lot of really positive stories about things. Uh, but we also recognize that we need to touch on some tough stories and look at them from all sides and explain kind of what happened and look at it again with, with the view that we can to talk about the situations that happened and how the marshal services progressed from those stories. And we are getting to, yeah, we had all kinds of, different technical issues with different things falling apart here, but we're getting there. Um, but we get to tell a lot of those stories. We get to talk about uh, U.S. Marshal Muir, Deputy Cheshire, as we go through and talk about the different events uh, surrounding their tragic deaths. Um, but we get to talk more back into history uh, about a variety of people as we continue to look into uh, the story of the Marshal Service. And when everything goes wrong, everything will go wrong. And should be back up to be able to answer your questions here in a second. If you'll just bear with me. And we'll sit the water there. But uh, let's every time I think we're almost there, we're not. But um, the Marshall Service, so we get we're gonna we're really excited about the opportunity to tell that story, uh, not just about the area of Fort Smith, but also to talk about uh, the area everywhere else around the country. Uh, whether it's stories of things that took place in North Dakota, uh, stories about things which have taken place in Washington State. We talked about the arrest of Christopher Boyce, uh, amazing stories and all of that. We get to talk about the changing nation, how the Marshal Service was there for every major event in American history. Whether you're talking about things like the 
uh, like the Whiskey Rebellion uh, or different events like the integration of Old Miss, uh, this New Orleans School District, other issues regarding segregation. Uh, we get to talk about different events uh, involved with um, their participation in different court actions, court events, investigations um, that may have resulted in different people being arrested, uh, just being able, just doing their jobs. And in some cases, uh, we get to find out a little bit more about our American nation because that's one of the things the Marshalls Museum also looks at is our ability to tell the story of the country, uh, not just the history of the country and the history of that organization, but how really the Marshall Service falls back on the Constitution and the rule of law as a big part of what it is that we do. There we go. I think I'm finally up to be able to Has your chat bar popped up yet? Okay, any good? There we go. Now, Mike. Here we go. Yeah, Southern New York's. Now I'm back on to everybody's comments. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to disappoint people who are John Wayne fans. I love John Wayne to death. I grew up watching him, and I really enjoyed his stuff. But uh, he is. Uh, very definitely, especially at that time frame, his stories were very much uh, stories that were John Wayne films within some particular area. It was almost to the point where a lot of Elvis films were Elvis films that had just some other different subject line. Uh, but uh, let's see. All right. And so, yeah. Um, but uh, unless there's another question that I see coming up, uh, I know I didn't get a chance to check the uh, all the comments. And then if there are any comments after the Southern New York's Marshal is former Secret Service, unless there's another comment after that, uh, I think that uh, we are, if there's anything in particular that somebody is wanting to hear about, uh, by all means, I would love to answer their question. Um, I do remember towards the beginning of this, there were a few people wanting to know about Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves, hold on a second. Bass Reeves is a very special person. He's very near and dear to a lot of us here. Uh, we consider Bass Reeves to be the one of, one of the finest law enforcement officers which has ever been around our country. Uh, born an enslaved person, uh, just across the river here in Crawford County, Arkansas, is um, the person who uh, was his owner, moved his entire plantation to Texas. Uh, as Bass was older, when the Civil War hit, the story goes that the, his owner's son became an officer in, the civil, in a Confederate unit from Texas in the Civil War and took Bass with him as his manservant. Uh, Bass went uh, and was with him at some point, we're not sure exactly when, but by most tellings of the story, uh, while he was with his owner in an encampment, they were playing cards at some point, and his owner's son said, if you win this hand, I will give you your freedom. To which uh, Bass obviously went along, and Bass ended up winning the hand, to which his owner's son said, no, I'm just kidding, I didn't really mean that. And as a result of that, Bass struck and struck his owner's son, knocked him unconscious, took his pocket watch and left, uh, escaping to his freedom in what would later become Oklahoma, was at the time Indian territory, uh, we believe down into Choctaw territory, which bordered on Texas, uh, very close to where the plantation was and very close to where uh, Bass's future wife was also there at that plantation. Um, I've mentioned before that the Marshalls Museum has the best collection of Bass Reeves materials anywhere. 
among those, we have what we believe is his watch. And I have taken a look at all of the silver proof marks on here. This is an English case. So all the silver proof marks were very well documented. Uh, we know when it was proofed. We know at which proofing uh, location it was proofed. This particular piece was proofed in 19, no, sorry, 1862. So we know that this could very well have been something that took place at that time. Uh, so we're doing more research on that as we continue to look at uh, Bass Reeves' story. Um, we also have, I don't know, he's in the water. We also have a number of firearms in our collection here. Uh, we have a uh, Spencer carving. We have a Winchester model 1892. We have a couple of single action Colt revolvers and we have a Colt 1902 pistol that he used when he was a Muscogee police officer following his uh, no longer being a deputy marshal. We also, uh, excuse me, we also have a, uh, another revolver and a Winchester 1873. Those are both on loan to the National Sporting Arms Museum. That's at the Bass Pro Shop in Springfield, Ma Springfield, Missouri. So if you happen to be traveling on I-44 and you go through Springfield, you can go ahead and stop in at the Bass Pro Shop and see a couple of our guns there. Uh, eventually, those guns will be back here as part of our collection in preparation for our opening up. Um, I saw a question earlier about when are we going to open. That kind of comes back down to it. Uh, once the fundraising gets up and we are able to call out, I described earlier the process of putting in our exhibits. Uh, once that gets done, uh, that'll take about 15 months to produce the exhibit, well, the museum experience, we like to call it. Um, once that is done and open, that's when they'll be about 15 months out from whenever we make that phone call. So whenever we hit that point in our development, we know that we're going to be letting everybody know and we're going to be looking at that timeline. Uh, so we are very much looking forward to this. Uh, we're very much hoping that that's going to happen sooner rather than later. And we recognize though that, uh, especially given the financial situation in the world today, that uh, there may be a hiccup there. But we are in a very good place right now. Uh, the museum is still the museum. We've just uh, not allowed people into the building since uh, a few weeks ago as part of our museum's plan, uh, which we announced at the time, to uh, close our offices. Everybody is kind of sheltering in place on our own part at home, which is why I'm typically the one person here on staff who's here in the building. All of our other staff members, they're all still working, they're still fully employed, and they're all working from home. And although occasionally, depending on what's going on, we'll have some people come in. But uh, we're all very happy to uh, have that. But any of our news, you can stay up. Uh, I think Casey just linked the, uh, yep, the newsletters link. You can also stay on our Facebook page or follow us on our socials. We're pretty active on Twitter and on Instagram, and we're more than happy to do that. We also have a YouTube channel. We've been posting some more videos there. We're gonna to continue to post some more videos there, and we're gonna to try to continue to answer those, any questions that you guys have. Uh, hopefully at some point in the future, we'll have some more uh, Facebook Lives, whether it's a little bit more targeted to specific objects, specific activities in the museum, uh, we'll do that. Other than that, if uh, unless there are no other questions, uh, I'll give everybody a minute or so, and then uh, we'll probably go ahead, and I know I've been talking nonstop for most of an hour now, uh, but if, uh, if nothing else, you can always uh, send us notes, send us ideas, and we'll be happy to tackle those in the future. And I don't think anybody needs to sit around and watch me drink any more water. But uh, if uh, nobody has a collect, uh, question, um, we're going to go ahead and sign off today. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. I hope everybody is staying healthy. I hope everybody is keeping their distance, uh, washing their hands. Uh, as silly as it might seem, uh, it's the best thing that we can do. And I know that we are very much hoping that everybody takes care of themselves and continues to stay safe over the next few weeks. 
But uh, thank you for tuning in to our live stream. We have uh, had a pretty good amount of people on the entire time. And I'm really happy to see everybody showing up. Uh, by all means, if you have any questions, contact us through our Facebook page, contact us through Twitter or Instagram, contact us through our main uh, webpage, and we will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have, and we will continue on. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.